The president, who suffered such forebodings at the prospect of war, calls for force. Force without stint or limit. Righteous and triumphant force. Untouched by battle, the American landscape is altered by the war. Washington, once described as a drowsy capital, becomes a boom town in 1917. This is the time in American history when government grows into big government, spending almost as much on the 20-month war as in the previous century and a quarter of its history. Dozens of new agencies, a federal payroll that nearly doubles from 500,000 employees to almost a million, not to mention the unpaid volunteers. Liberty bonds, Allied Relief, Red Cross, scores of wartime causes. For just one dollar a year, government secures the services of some of its most distinguished citizens, an army of businessmen like Thomas A. Edison and Bernard Baruch. One observer calls Washington a patriotic madhouse. One of the new faces in government, Herbert Hoover, organizer of worldwide relief for Belgium in 1915, now summoned to run the food program at home. Battalions of volunteers work farms and plant war gardens to help feed the nation and the Allies. For housewives, the watchwords are, save food. The public translates it into Hooverize. Out in the field, for women and youngsters, the slogan is, do a man's job. Love may not change, but motherhood will never be the same after this war. America's women, taking on a man's job, work up new arguments to support their demands for the vote. Demands that will be fulfilled in a constitutional amendment after the war. How are you going to keep them out of the voting booth after they've helped win the war? <laughs>